Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'm glad to see you here. Um, this is joint work with these people. Um, I am at Citroen Informatics. I joined this year. This is uh, the materials company that Maxwell Hutchinson presented yesterday on. And I am still somewhat affiliated with the Fritz Haber Institute of the Max Planck Society, where I was before. Uh, and I would like to talk about the assessment of scientific machine learning models from several perspectives. So <clears throat> this talk has three parts also to accommodate that we might discuss longer on one of them. The first part will be about benchmarking prediction errors. In a specific setting, that is, uh, we want to benchmark exact representations, features for interpolating uh, up initial calculations, uh, and we, we want to do it in a very thorough way. So let's, let's see how we do that, how we try to do that. Then there's a part about predictive uncertainties of machine learning models, where the question is more basic, so how do we do that in the first place? And maybe some um, interesting insights that we got while, while attempting to judge how, how good our predictive uncertainties are. And then if we get to it, I also have a part about something relatively new, locality of errors, which is directly related to the previous speaker's uh, Chris Sutton's talk, where it's about that the error is not only an average, it is actually uh, spatially dependent on your input space, right? You have regions of high and low error, and how to deal with that, or use, use that. Uh, okay. So. The first part is about benchmarking prediction errors of a specific class of models. So where are we? We are, again, in the world of molecules and materials. So we, <coughs> about atoms, assemblies of atoms. And uh, the, the setting, uh, the application here is that we want to predict properties of these molecules and materials. There are very different uh, settings here. Um, in particular, so we, um, no, I should, I should mention that. So uh, the major way people use machine learning models here is as a surrogate model. So instead, you have a function that is expensive to evaluate. It could be a calculation on your supercomputer. It could be an experiment in the laboratory, but it's expensive. Uh, and the, 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 the function tells you, if I give you a material molecule as input, what is this property I'm interested in? And machine learning is used as a surrogate model. Okay, it's, we try to estimate the result of this expense, uh, the, the, the value of this expense function without actually evaluating it, but, but we try to predict it. This is the, the, what we want to achieve here. And if you can do that, then you can, uh, if in the computational arena, uh, screen much larger databases, you can uh, run longer simulations, um, these things. And in the experimental arena, well, you, you save a lot of time and effort and money in the laboratory. <clears throat> You're faster and cheaper if this is successful. So these two settings, experimental and simulations, these differ quite a lot, mostly in the features and the noise. So for experimental data, we usually have very incomplete information. Sometimes you only have the composition, which, which, which elements are in this thing, but we don't even know the structure. Um, we have very high noise, same experiment, same company, same experiment, two different laboratories, different results. It, all kinds of crazy in that arena. Uh, and um, yeah, and, the, and, and for the uh, simulations, we have no noise. These are deterministic computational procedures. We have something like numerical noise, like beyond the convergence, the bits are random, but that, that is tiny and negligible. And um, <clears throat> we usually have complete information. What we get is a set of atoms and their positions in space, and we want to break, for example, the energy. So we know everything about the system, the complete opposite of the other thing. So these two look very similar, but they are not at all. Um, so what are the challenges that we have? Both arenas are joined in that uh, they have small training sets. What does small mean? Well, for experiment on the order of 10 to 100, if you're very lucky, 1,000. For the computational, it depends. I mean, they are exceptionally hard calculations where you might have on the same order, but sometimes you have maybe several hundreds or thousands, sometimes tens of thousands. The really large data sets that we sometimes see, like the QM9 data set that we created, 134,000 molecules, these are benchmarking data sets. This is not how it usually works. This was created specifically to, to uh, test uh, some of our machine learning models. Right? Um, but usually you have less data than that. Uh, yeah, and the input spaces are large. These are all combinatorial input spaces. If you look at an alloy and um, 
Uh, you, you can calculate, let's say, if you change your composition in steps of half a percent, and you have five elements, and then you can calculate how many different combinations you can create, and, and, and it's always an astronomical number. So all, all these atomistic spaces are very large. OK, so that's the setting. And uh, what do we have <laughs> What that helps us? Well, we have domain knowledge. This is the primary uh, tool to improve the machine learning models. For example, uh, for a bit more, uh, so the, the most important thing is that your data is clear, uh, clean. So curated data, good data, that, without that, you're done. So if you have that, um, then features. Features are the second most important thing. And in the features already, you can include so much domain knowledge. And I'll show some very specialized feature sets for these calculations when we want to have surrogate models for these numerical simulations. And then, well, people have started to use all kinds of tricks from the machine learning community in general. So we, we have active learning. We have training with gradients. Because these are um, for the calculations, we get them for free, essentially, at least the first derivative. Uh, so people try to use the toolbox that is there. But this is, uh, I would say, well, it depends. You can't, you can't really put it in order. Gradients helps a lot, for sure. But the features are very important. Okay, This is the general setting. Any questions on that? Good. Let's go on, then. Yeah, this is OK. I will skip over this and, and, and favor more interesting parts. This is just the repetition. We have molecules and materials. We want to map them to a property. Please do note that there is an error bar here. I'll come back to that. This is a very important part. And we do this with machine learning, where we essentially have these parts. We have features. This here, I'll talk about that. We have three parameters that we need to set somehow. I will briefly address that. And we have the learning algorithm itself. Um, so let's talk about benchmarking prediction errors. So here we will be in the setting where we want to have a sur surrogate models for um, uh, up initio numerical simulations. So no noise, complete information. For this specific setting, uh, we know a lot about how to define our features. So. I will talk about vector space representations, so anything that can be have has constant length and numbers uh, in, in, <laughs> in a specific order um, for the purpose that I mentioned. And then I will briefly discuss that there's a set of requirements from physics that we want to fulfill. Uh, this excludes all what is called in camera informatics descriptors, which is kind of more loosely related numbers that describe very specific aspects. For example, the surface accessible a solvent accessible surface of a molecule would be one number, a descriptor. That's something typically used in chemical informatics for experimental data. This is not considered here. This is not appropriate for this setting, for, computer, for interpolating calculations. Fingerprints also not. They are also coarse graining. We don't want anything that loses information. Uh, OK. So what are these requirements? Uh, let's briefly step through them. Um, so again, this is for a particular setting where we want to interpolate the results of numerical simulations. Complete information, no noise. OK, we want to have be either invariant or uh, covariant with transformations that, oh, sorry, my, my mistake. Um, Yes, we want, OK, OK. For, for scalar properties, we want to be invariant against transformations that do not change the property. These are, for example, uh, translations and rotations, right? The energy doesn't change if the molecule is here, here, or if it rotates. Uh, except, of course, if you have an external field, then it will. So it depends on your problem, on the property that you're modeling. It's not, uh, yeah, this is dependent on the property, and this is important. Um, OK, think, for example, about reflection, whether that is necessary or not. That depends a lot on which property also, and on, your math, on how you calculate the, the energy, for example. OK, the, the counterpart to this is uniqueness. Everything that does change the property needs to change uh, the represent. Also, I'm sorry, uh, I should mention, because there were several, several talks uh, mentioning this, of, if you uh, predict a tensorial property, so like force vectors, for example, then you do need to be covariant with that. Right? OK. The counterpart is uniqueness. Anything that changes your property needs to change your representation of the input as well. Otherwise, you will immediately introduce an, uh, an error. Because if there are two systems which are different, but your representation is the same, the machine cannot distinguish them. It will make one prediction, and that is by definition wrong on, on one of them, at least. So 
you, inter you, you need to have this property, which is then also necessary and, and sufficient, to uh, go back from your features to your original atomistic system, up, of course, to these invariances, which is a nice property to have often, right? You do something fun fancy in your uh, uh, feature space, and then you want to go back. Huh? Image, uh, as a pre-image problem. Doable if you have this property. Should be smooth because our machine learning models are smooth, right? This, this is simply, it goes well with physics, like potential energy surfaces. They get smoother the more, the higher the level of theory is. And that, that is a, a, a one thing. But also, uh, the usual assumptions we make is like, if you have, um, if you know your function at two points, in principle, you know nothing in between. Right? The, your, your model function can do anything here, it can be cantor dust, whatever. Yeah? So we, we have to make an assumption, and the usual assumption is to say that this is somehow smooth. And uh, that is why we want our features to be smooth as well, ideally differentiable, so we can use gradients. They need to be fast. So for example, I can use the electron density as features, but that's really, man, that's great feature, but if I have computed that, I don't, I'm done. <laughs> so I don't need the, the prediction anymore. So this needs to be fast to compute. It should be sample efficient, right? We have few data, remember? Uh, so we want this to work well with uh, few data. And in principle, we want this to be general, uh, or at least I want it to be general, in the sense that we can, in principle, at least put any atomistic system there. We are not there yet. There are many things like, uh, what about uh, spins and isotopes and excited states and so, but we, we, we are doing well here. Okay, and I, I, I believe personally that it should also be as simple as possible both conceptually and to implement. OK, let's have a look at some of these representations. How do they look like? What are they? Uh, so I will show a few of them. These are symmetry functions by Jörg Wähler, uh, who's now in Göttingen in Germany. He has, I think he was one of the first ones to come up with representations for high dimensional systems, many atoms. And uh, what's happening here is basically this is just symmetry functions. Oh, these are a local representation, so they always represent an atom and its local environment. So there's a cutoff radius here. Uh, uh, but what happens here is just the symmetry function is just a bunch of radial and angular functions. So they, they look at um, what are the uh, uh, what are the distances to this, and then, then you pose some function of a distance, or what are the angles, maybe you take three atoms, all, all triplets, and pose some function of, of these three atoms. And then you have usually an exponential in there, so you can focus on certain distances, for example, here, and if you, basically the message is, you can systematically create a large number of functions which describe, each function describes a specific aspect, for example, uh, how far is a hydrogen atom from the central carbon atom? Um, uh, how many of those are there within a certain distance? Smoothly. Um, these are, this is the uh, key concept of uh, symmetry functions. So question to you, is this too superficial or, or is that okay? I, I'm just showing the concepts here. You can, I, I can give you the exact formula, but they really don't tell you much beyond this picture. Um, so this, uh, then there is smooth overlap of atomic positions, which was introduced by Gabor Chani, who is here in the audience, and his co-workers. Uh, it's again a local representation, so atoms in their environment. And what happens here is that uh, you put uh, Gaussians, for example, on the, on the atoms, and then you have, choose a basis for some spherical harmonics uh, and integrate out rotations. Um, yeah, I think that's the shortest way I can say it. I'm sure you disagree, but uh, yeah. Uh, and then you create something, going for the actual descriptor, you can either compute a kernel or you can compute the actual features like a power spectrum, for example. So it's again a way to describe these local environments, but different in the choice of basis functions. Yes, please. So you did all this gymnastics to get around representing them as graphs, right? No, it's wrong to represent them as graphs, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I can, I, can, I can tell why. I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong to use graphs, uh, it, it, but I say in this particular scenario, it's not the ideal choice. Why? Um, because you're, if you move this atom here, a delta in any direction, for example, your, el your energy will change by some small delta, right? So you have to take, it's not like you can draw some lines here and say only these connections are important. All of them are important. So that means if you have a graph, it needs to be complete. And then, what's the point of having a graph, right? You just keep the labels of the atoms. Except that at some cutoff, it's it typically, at least if a molecule is material, yes. 
Well, it, it, is, it is true. Uh, what people do if you do it local, so these two representations are local representations. And what you do is you introduce a finite cutoff. That's right. But you do want to be informed about all changes on these atoms inside the cutoff. You still can't pose a graph there. So if, you're, if you have less information, like for example, you get the molecular structure graph, well then the graph is precisely the right thing to do. And this is not the right thing to do. Because you have less information. So one point, I make all these are alternative representations. But if you go down graphs, you immediately suck in a graph isomorphism problem. Whereas if you base it on densities, and both soap and uh, your trailers are very great cross representations, they're immediately invariant to uh, mutations. And that's why. And it, it's I am aware that I am of course aware that people work that way and I, 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 my first paper was on a graph kernel so I am not opposed to graphs right and it's one of my better papers I have to say um, so but I think they are the right tool when you naturally have a graph structure like when you have a chemical structure graph you don't know the atom positions you can't use that information you cannot do this but you can use a graph it's the right abstraction so my, my personal argument here would be use the right abstraction and here the right abstraction is you need to use all of the information of course, with practical cutoffs, so that's right. Thank you. OK, last one. That's ours, many, many body tensor representation. This is not a local representation, although you can make it so. Uh, Patrick Rinke from Alto did, also and his co-workers. Uh, Laurie Himan, I think. So um, you have a system. And MBTR, all that MBTR does is you look at, as a separate, you, you stratify by element combinations. So like you look at all carbon-carbon uh, combinations or carbon-hydrogen separately. And for each combination, let's say for the two-body terms, you just look at the distances and construct a histogram. And that's it. <coughs> it's the most simple thing you can do. You can do that for two-body terms, then it's like distance histograms separately per element, right? For example, all the carbon-carbon uh, distances would form one histogram, all the carbon-hydrogen would form another histogram. You can use three-body terms. You just have to have a function which, gives, which takes a bunch of also k atoms and gives you a number back. And that, gives you, and that number you put in it, broadened into a histogram. That's the many-body tensor representation. And I can do this for the whole system. So here, it's, I'm not describing a single atom in this environment. I describe the whole molecule or whole material. Yes, please. Can you uh, explain your thinking and how this is different from the fingerprint type? How does this um, OK, you mean like in, the, in chemoinformatics? Right, like you said in slide. Yeah. Um, yes, so a, a fingerprint in camera from basically you have a database or dictionary of uh, substructures, for example, a five carbon ring, and then you just count off and that appears. The only difference here is that in the fingerprint setting, you count something much more abstract than here because you, you don't care about the atom positions. You just see, oh, there's a ring structure. I count that, right? Fun or a functional group like OH. But here we really take the exact distances into account. That's the difference. That's the only difference. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. For example, H two. <laughs> we would have one distance. <laughs> we have just one line and one peak, and that's it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this is a great question, and I will not talk about that. But um, yeah, so the point here is: imagine you have a um, you have a, a multi a, 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 an alloy with many elements. This is a fancy thing over the last twenty years, and uh, you would have not like two different elements, but maybe five or seven. And you would and you look at all triplets because you want angle information. That's a long, long list. Your tensor is pretty large by then. And if you do four body terms, you're dead. So one idea is we should be able to have cross correlation here. Like, for example, if you think about halogens, fluor, uh, 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 chlorine, fluorine, chlorine, bromide, th these are similar somehow chemically. If you have a data set with tons of fluorines but very few chlorines, we, we should be able to infer something ob ob about the chlorines. And this is called so-called a chemical learning. Anatoly von Lilienfeld is, I think, the best specialist I know on this. 
And uh, this is uh, being actively worked on. Here's some very nice papers, uh, a recent one, where they show that this works in principle. And, uh, and uh, yeah, you could apply it here too. I, I tried a little bit with very simple cross correlations, but I, th I think the proper, um, after reading Anatol's papers, I think the proper way to do is you define a space on the chemical elements. It can be a simple space, like row and column in the periodic table, 2D space. And then you don't have these separate lines. You have one space cross the other space. And I think that's, that's a good approach to try. Yeah. But of course, there's a lot of other work on that topic, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, so these were three examples of the current state of the art. There are more of these representations, not, but not too many more, maybe half a dozen of the really good ones. So, uh, okay, in the interest of time, let me be brief. <coughs> um, excuse me. Uh, you can phrase all of these, if you read the papers, they look very different. But there's an article by Mich Michele Ceriotti and co-workers, who was also here on one of the previous days, where they have a joint mathematical framework uh, in bracket notation, since they like physics. Uh, and you, you, you can see from there that there are really only a few concepts that, that create all of these different representations. I don't want to go into it too much, um, but it's basically you have to f define a k-body function. You have to decide how to deal with symmetries. Do you integrate or do you build them in already? So there's a few, few of these, but it's not many concepts. And uh, you can understand all these different representations in terms of these same concepts. Uh, and personally, I think that is very fascinating and insightful. Uh, it's not the focus today, so I don't want to go into that. But you can read it up uh, in, um, in uh, Michele's paper. And we also have a section on that in our forthcoming uh, overview article. Um, now, with all of this background, now to the benchmarking. <clears throat> what do we do? There are several benchmarking papers out there. Um, so how is ours different? Is it different? Uh, well, what we wanted to do is we wanted to do a thorough thing here. We want to isolate the effect of the features of the re uh, representations and nothing else. So how do we do that? Well, we, I mean, we, we build models on uh, benchmarking data sets and compare their performance in terms of the prediction error. But we control for all other factors. That means we use the same kernel regression method with all of them. In the literature, if you just pull the numbers, you compare apples and pears because one guy uses neural networks and there's a Gaussian process here and there. <coughs> Same thing for all of them. Kernel rich as a Gaussian process regression and with a single Gaussian kernel, um, which is a good choice because of the smoothness uh, from before. Uh, we, the hyperparameter optimization, we use the same method to optimize all the both structural as architectural hyperparameters, like how many functions, how, which functions, as well as the numerical parameters. We do this using three structures, Parson estimators. So basically what we do is a stochastic sampling. As, Monte, as we, we, we just draw samples from the uh, theta space and, and, and try to do it in a bit directed way. So, uh, there's nothing much you can do because these spaces of possible parameter choices are very large. Usually these are tuned by hand. We didn't want to do that because you immediately introduce bias. The most frequent bias is when people compare their own method against another method. Yeah, sure, you don't know the other methods and then you, you optimize them a little bit or not at all and then your method you know in and out and you optimize it to death and of course it's better. That's what you see in machine learning like 80% of the time and it's really not the right thing to do. Um, so here we, we treat them all the same. Still, we have to define these spaces, but we contact the original authors and ask them for help as well. Uh, and then sampling. This is important and underrated. <coughs> we do, and the, the underlying assumption in machine learning is that the, all the data points come from the same distribution. And we make sure that this is so by when we choose training sets, we do so by multivariate stratification. We make sure that the distribution in a, a certain number of uh, aspects like number of uh, chemical elements and distribution of the energy is all the same in the overall set and in the subsets. So keep variance low there. Just as an example why this is important, we have a uh, look at this. This is with a data set uh, uh, of materials um, that, that we created with Gus Hart and co-workers. And um, <clears throat> I'm looking only at the effect when I include or exclude the smallest structures in there. The smallest are important because there are not so many of them. So how do you read this figure? Um, K is the, um, <coughs> is the number of atoms. So uh, if, uh, yeah, to the left, I exclude the smallest the structure with K or less atoms from the training data. And here I make sure that they are all included. 
So, and what happens is simply, if you exclude them, the machine has never seen these small things and, and has large errors. And when you include them, when you include them all, it just wrote learns. I mean, then the training data, they have zero error. And, and they don't influence the overall error anymore. That's what's happening here. Uh, and you see that you can tune the error almost over uh, three orders of magnitude. I mean, so far it's a bit exaggerated, but still, it ha it, you, can ha you can achieve an almost arbitrary large effect that will drown out all other signal. And this, is, this, ex this example I put here just to, to show why it is relevant to, to be careful when you do this. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Okay, and this, this, um, this, I mean, this relies on the fact that the small structures are relatively few. Right? <coughs> yeah. Anyway, it's an, an illustration how this can influence results. Okay, now to the results of our benchmark. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's known how, how to evaluate the errors, right? We have here increasing training set sizes. Here we have the root mean squared error of an energy. Uh, we do this here for this benchmarking data set that I mentioned of small organic molecules. And uh, let's look at this here. This is the many-body tensor representation with only two-body terms or two and three-body terms, so only distance information and then with angles. These are the symmetry functions, same thing, and this is SOAP, which is a multi-body expansion. And what we see is something that we think makes physical sense. We see that the performance improves pretty homogeneously uh, with the number of, uh, in, with the interaction number. If you have only distances and then add the angles, you'll get better. Well, that seems to make sense to me. Um, we tried the same thing with uh, <coughs> materials. So here's a data set um, with uh, 15,000 uh, binary alloys. Uh, and you see, if you look at this figure, you see roughly the same effect. Okay. Sorry, it looks like lines because you drew lines, but it doesn't actually look much like <laughs> Yeah. So, okay, okay, good, fair point. Let me explain the lines. Um, that, that is true. It makes a huge difference visually for, for you. Uh, that, that is right. So what we are seeing here is uh, the prediction errors over a certain number of, uh, of, sam of, of samples of the same size. These are the uh, box whisker plots for those. And the fits are from, as a from learning theory. The, the fits as well, the, the, the learning error, as well, the prediction error as a function of this training set size it, it decreases as a negative exponent of the training set size. And we fit that, and that is what gives us in this log log plot these lines. So these, it, for small sample sizes, they can be bad. And so we weight these here more. This is why they miss here and, and fit better here. This is on purpose, because asymptotics kick in like when you go to large sizes. But the form of the fit is from theory. Yes? So these are Gaussian yeah. fits to using those things that descriptors to GDD now. So yes. In the soap, what was your exponent? <laughs> I don't know. You have to ask myself that. You can make them two and three points. Ah, we didn't think about that. Right? So if you leave that exponent as one, you're much more comparing apples to apples. Here. Well, I mean, we, we were actually, uh, I think the observation in itself is fine. Uh, but this is a very good point. I didn't know that. And we should do it. So you have three slope yeah. The exponent one, two, exactly. And if our pro if our hypothesis is correct, soap should precisely also with the in decrease in body order should shift up. Let's see if it really does. It's a very nice confirmation. Thank you. Um, can you remind me of that? <laughs> because I will forget. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, more questions? Okay. Um, yeah, this, this, is, this is basically the result. There's one more aspect here, and that is uh, runtime. So uh, these Pareto plots, show, as this, these plots here show, the time uh, uh, to compute the features um, and the error. And each point, well, is also here, yeah, you, you see the legend. And you want to be in the lower left corner. So this tells you a little bit about the trade-off. One thing you can see here is, again, the higher the interaction order, the more time you have to invest. I mean, that's super clear, because uh, if you go over uh, uh, two, as a two tuples only, then, and then go over three tuples, of course, there are more of them. You need more time for that. Um, at least that is one factor that I, I, I propose here in this. Um, yeah, and then. The, I mean, these, these are not published yet. We are still working on them. But I think they are reasonably converged to the extent that I'm comfortable showing them. Yes, please. What are the two different panels? Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, yeah, you're right. 
the GDB9 data set and the BA10 data set yeah, that you know of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for example, if you say, oh, I know how accurate I, ha I, I need to be here, and then you could choose, for example, the fastest method if you wanted to. Yeah, th that is not certainly not the only consideration, but it is a consideration. Yours. I know. I, I, I actually <laughs> didn't show it here because of you. Um, I wanted to show the original. But um, yeah, uh, that is true. There is an, and there are, so we are in the lucky situation that some of the people from Patrick Rink and Alto have re implemented the soap descriptor of Gabor and have also made some alternatives like different set of basis functions. So we were now able to compare those. And they are different in both accuracy and speed. Yeah, yes. We can, we can talk about this later also. So the third axis, a third axis could be the number of data points you have, which tells you which representation. Yeah, we were a bit confused on that, right? We normalized here, but um, um, we could try. But it's always very hard to visualize with three, right? 2D plots are easy. 3D is all, always a bit fiddly already, and so. But we could try, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's certainly, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's an attempt. It's probably not the best one, yeah. Maybe, maybe we could try this. And I should also mention, for example, they, 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 I, I give a compressed overview, right? For example, if you have a, a local representation, well, then you have to do many more ca uh, feature calculations than if you have a global one, because in a global one, each atom is only considered once, whereas uh, in the local approach, each atom and its environment is considered, right? So, so you, uh, th there are other trade-offs here that I have not explicitly mentioned. But the gist, you got. I think that's it here. Yeah, so to summarize, uh, I talked a little bit about the scenario of interpolate, of creating surrogate models for uh, atomistic numerical simulations. I showed you three of the state of the art representations and uh, talked a bit about why and how we want to do the uh, benchmarking in a rigorous way. And the result was that both accuracy and runtime increases with the modeled interaction order. All right. We had some questions already. Are there still questions on this part? Because that, that's the it then for that. <laughs> okay. Uh, in that case, let's go on to the second part: uh, predictive uncertainties. So, um, what's that? Well, we want to have error bars on our predictions. Why? Because these are these are crucial for for. Uh, 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 at least two aspects that are uh, important for us as well. Uh, one is human assessment. If you go to someone and say, I predict that this, if you make this material, it will improve 10% in the desired uh, property, and that person wants to know how reliable that is, right? If you, if you go and say, I am 90% sure that this will happen, it's a very different thing than if you go and say, oh, I'm 55% sure. <laughs> it might also decrease. Who knows? Right? I mean, this is very important for human assessments. And if you work with people who rely on your predictions, they will come back, check your error bars, and say, hey, look, um, <laughs> you were like too much outside of your error bars. Um, so that's one important aspect. You can only you have to know how much you can trust a prediction. And the other is active learning. Active learning is being used increasingly, which is great. But active learning uh, requires uh, an acquisition function. And this requires predictive uncertainties, right? Um, so your active learning uh, will be directly influenced by the quality of your, uh, your estimate of how reliable the predictions are. So these are two reasons uh, why we think this is very important. Um, so what influences the predictive uncertainty? Well, um, first of all, I, I should like to say that while for prediction errors, it's pretty straightforward and standard procedure how to evaluate them. But for predictive uncertainty, this is much less the case, I would say, at least what I could find. Okay, but let, let, let's, let's get back to that later. So what, here, this, the, I made this completely up. Please tell me if there are better ways to do this. Um, I, basically, I, I just directly <laughs> copied this conceptually from the uh, uh, analysis of prediction errors. So I, I claim here that predictive uncertainty is uh, um, basically composed of something I would call approximation uncertainty, which is essentially model limitations. Think of your noise model. Is it a good model, right? Is, does it fit the data? Uh, the the regressor, regression method you have, is, is that the right one? Is um, Are your features good, right? All these things. 
Then there's a contribution from estimation uncertainty. So that is just how, mu how much training data do you have, your training data density, right? You have your, your model. So like, like think of it like this. This is your function space, and uh, uh, maybe the b <laughs> this is what you want to learn, and the best model as a function in your function space is this one here. This is the approximation. And then you have to find this, right, given a finite number of training data. So this is the estimation part. And then sometimes you have an optimization contribution. This is basically like when you have a neural network and you, you, you stop too early training it, for example, right? Because you think, ah, I'm good enough. Uh, then maybe you have another contribution here. Uh, yeah. I will not talk about this optimization part, but I would like to talk about these two parts. So this is standard in, uh, in a learning theory uh, um, and erotic composition, and I think it roughly translates to the uncertainties as well. But again, if you know this better than me, please do let me know. Okay, what's this? Let's look at this approximation contribution. So the noise model, usually we have IID ga additive Gaussian noise, homoscedastic. So, so we, we say uh, your, our, our, uh, we have some f of x, and then we have plus epsilon, epsilon is IID Gaussian. This is maybe the model you see like 95% of the time at least. Is that good? Well, um, I tried to find out a bit. Um, so here I took an experimental data set where I do know the distribution of the measurements because this uh, were experimentally determined band gaps which had been measured multiple times per material. Um, this is unfortunately very rare type of data set to find, but we have some of them. And now what I did, all I did here is I said, okay, if I have a single Gaussian, right, this, this noise model, how well can I, uh, if I fit that to the, the observed uh, uh, um, distributions, assuming they are normal, uh, how good can I be? And then if I do the same with a heteroscedastic model where I can for each input uh, have its own uh, width. Of course, that is always much better because I have more parameters, but the question is how much better? And what I think what this shows is that this is not the right model. Um, so. The error in this data set, at least if it's an additive error, um, does not seem to, as I still have to check for multiplicative, does not seem to be homoscedastic. And then I took some more data sets from uh, so, uh, actual experimental, experimental data sets, and I, I got basically the same results. Yeah, sometimes a bit less pronounced the effect, sometimes a bit more. So it seems to me that the usual noise model is not that great for real experimental data. Um, so, one contribution to uncertainty, wrong noise model. What about, feature, oopsie, what about features? Uh, so now I'm, I'm talking about experimental data where we have huge noise and we don't know the complete information, right? We have very little information and that can also hurt. So here, for example, is this toy function that some of you may remember. Um, it has two-dimensional function. And now if I only know dimension A, so if I project on the uh, dimension A, what I get is this. So from the, if I have that as input on my machine learning model, what all I can see is that the error is very small here and it's very large here. And I, I cannot see where that error comes from because I do not have access to that second axis. So if you're missing features, you can get strong noise signal. And uh, in experimental data, you almost never have complete information. So this is something that actually happens frequently. Um, that's one source of uncertainty, right? So, um, okay, uh, now slightly change gear. Okay, we have now an idea of, of where uncertainty comes from. How do we measure it? Uh, I thought hey, I would go to the literature and say, hey, um, give, give me the standard metric how to, how to measure the predictive uncertainty, and then I came back, and, uh, okay, it's not so clear. I found two, two uh, like the like what root mean squared error, mean absolute error, is, and, and a correlation coefficient is for the prediction errors. What what are the corresponding evaluation metrics for predictive uncertainties? I found two that seems to have been used a bit more. These are the first two I would like to show, and then I searched a bit more, and I did find something like in the atmospheric sciences, for example. Maybe not so surprisingly, because they have these weather simulations, right? They want to judge, but uh, yeah. Um, uh, okay, so the first one is uh, just the uh, negative log predictive density uh, here. And um, this is basically just measuring, you, you pose a, uh, so 
This is your output space, and right, and then your prediction is um, uh, the prediction itself, the mean maybe, all, and then there's some distribution. I will always uh, restrict myself to normal distributions here, predictive normal distributions. So this is your dis prediction. It's a predictive distribution. And the question is, how good is this distribution? And normally, we don't know the, the true distribution. So what you can do is you can look at the predictive density. If the observed value is here, well, what's this number here? That's the, um, the uh, log predictive mean, negative log mean predictive density, as a predictive density. Uh, the figure shows for constant error as a, uh, what happens if you change sigma and you see that the, the best sigma depends kind of the, on the scale of this here. So this is one, one thing. I mean, it makes intuitive sense, right? How, how much probability density is there? You, one can show that this is the only local, uh, local because you only look at this single point here, only local proper scoring rule, uh, more or less. And uh, yeah. So is this good? Well, it depends. It's certainly motivated. However, um, there are some funny things people, people realized. So that was used in a competition, a machine learning competition uh, several years ago, many years ago maybe, uh, to judge uh, uh, entries. And uh, some people found out if your regression problem only has a, limit, a finite number of possible outcomes, so it's kind of more classification-like, well, all you need to do is you predict this always. So it doesn't matter what the input is, just always predict these spikes. And that means <laughs> your, your observed value is always one of these, and you always have very high density here. So you can easily game this metric. Maybe not obvious on first glance. At least it wasn't to me. So, OK. Let's see about more about that later. Um, now, this. Um, there's a second one that also seems. Real quick, yes, you please. Said you were only interested in Gaussians, but then you showed it. That is right. Okay, that is true. So, uh, so there's some. I'm making sure I understand the frame you have here. You're, you're just talking about, you know, prediction intervals yeah. as Gaussians yeah. on. The okay. Page. Yeah, that, that, yeah, you're right. Um, um, that was maybe too much. Uh, glossed over. So in principle, you can have arbitrary predictive distributions, right? No one keeps you from doing some crazy multimodal prediction. And most of this applies to the general case. But practically, you never do. Practically, all we ever do is kind of single peaked predictive distributions. So I'm, I'm, I, I, I will try to be more clear when I uh, do not make the assumption and when I make it. So the, the metrics uh, apply, I think, to the general case. But in practice, when it will show actual results, it will always be normal uh, predictive distributions. Yes? So well, one thing is, even if your model predicts a normal distribution, if you then post-process that output because you're interested in some figure of merit, uh, and you push it through nonlinear functions, right, you'll get something out which is not normal. And if your, your figure of merit depends maybe on some classification problem, you can pretty easily get bimodal figure. Uh, multimodal figures of merit as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, sure. And if you have graphical modeling and then you process, uh, it can get arbitrarily complicated. But well, let's try to, I, I'm, I'm not that complicated, so let's try to keep things simple here. Um, yeah, what about this one? What's that? Called continuous rank probability score. Now, this is a non local measure. What's happened? I mean, if you think about, for example, a temperature prediction. If you, if you predict, it will either be cr very cold or very hot. Th that's not a very useful prediction, right? But how, how do I address for that? If you predict zero, very cold or cold, that somehow makes more sense. And um, I mean, it's, uh, and for materials, this makes more sense for physical properties because um, you're unlikely to make a meaningful prediction that this material is either very brittle or very not brittle. No, I mean, it will be, the brittleness will be somehow here. And the previous one doesn't capture that, but this one does. So how does it work? What we see here is, assume this uh, dotted line is your prediction. So you predict a value of 0, and this is your uh, sigma of your prediction. And the solid line is the cumulative distribution function for this uh, normal prediction. Uh, and then what you do, what you say is, OK, now I look at the observed value that is here, the vertical line. And this also has a cumulative distribution function. It's just a step function, right? Because this is a delta distribution. You have a step CDF, and then you can just compute the difference, the shaded area. So this continuous rank probability score is just this shaded area here. 
Um, it's basically saying, uh, okay, I'll take your predictive distribution and I'll compare it to a delta observed distribution because I don't know the real observe, also the real um, distribution of the observable, but I know one observed value. Okay, let's put a delta there. That is what this thing does. Now, this has nice properties. It is not, it, oh, oh my goodness, okay. Uh, I'll try to finish in 10 minutes. Uh, Yeah, this is non-local because you look at the, uh, not only at the single point uh, of density, but on the probability mass around the observed value. This, but this is why this is non-local. And the one important observation that I still want to make is, this is a generalization of the mean absolute error in the following sense. If your predicted distribution, this, the dotted line, if that is a delta distribution too, so you say I only predict the number, no, no width, then, uh, you have two-step function and the, 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 the quantity you calculate is the mean absolute error. So this is a generalization of the mean absolute error in that sense. And we'll come back to that in a minute. So let me skip now. No, let me not skip now. Let me show you this. Uh, okay, <laughs> one more thing. Uh, this is not standard anymore. This is, um, well, I mean, it's not complicated, but it's not seen often. So if you if you if you're uh, if you get some pr yeah, let's say you're an experimentalist you get some predictions you do the stuff you 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 synthesize material measure it come back and then maybe you just count how often the actual observed value was within one standard deviation of the predictions right this is a simple thing to do and that motivated us here um, so assume ah. You, 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 do, uh, you, you um, calculate the standardized residual, so you, you take your prediction error and divide it by the predictive uncertainty. This gives you like Z scores that basically unit normal distributed numbers or something close to it, depending on your actual predictive distributions. I assume normal here. Uh, and then you, you can check out how normal that really is, right? If it's really normal, you should have 68% samples within one standard deviation. And then um, you, you count, just count that for, for what you observe. And um, for example, if, if you observe too many samples, so higher percentage, then your, your sigmas were too large that you predicted. You were underconfident. You basically had wide intervals, but too wide. If you have a lesser percentage in this, then you were overconfident. You, 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 you made your predicted sigmas too small, okay? And the, the difference between the expected and the observed percentage of samples within one standard deviation is also a, a metric that tells you how good, in some sense, uh, your predictive uncertainties are. Okay, and now I'll skip, <laughs> because otherwise we'll never finish. Uh, I'll show you some results on a simple toy function. This is the Morse potential, given here. It's kind of, the features are, it goes to zero for, in, for infinitely large input, uh, single uh, real input uh, variable. It has a dip here and goes to infinity here, up here, uh, for small uh, input variable. Um, and now, what we did is, uh, we, sorry, we learned this function here with the random forest and with the Gaussian process. Uh, the Gaussian process has a, some, the pr has a predictive variance which measures uh, distance from uh, training data and the random forest uh, we equipped with uh, an, an estimate, a calibrated estimate of uh, the uncertainty in a prediction based on jackknifing, so resampling. And then we just calculated these uh, different um, metrics. So let's look at this. Um, so this is the blue is the Gaussian process and orange is the random forest. There are some, there are a lot of nice small details which, which I cannot tell you, but for example, just one maybe. What's going on here? What's going on here is that with very few points, the Gaussian process, if you, if you optimize the likelihood, it cannot tell if these points came from a straight line, just have a lot of noise, or if it's a more complicated function. And uh, most, it, it, it initially thinks it's a line, oh, it's not so sure anymore, and here it switches and realizes, oh, this is not a line, this is like a curved thing. And there are, there are lots of funky little details like that, but let's not stick there. What we see here is the mean absolute error. And here we see this continuous rank probability score. That was this generalization um, that, that judges the, the, the predictive uncertainties. And what you see is you get almost the same signal. 
which is no surprise, because this measure is a generalization of this measure. And for normal distributions, they are not very different. Is that, uh, that struck us as not so useful, because it doesn't give us additional signal. Um, skipping the other ones. Oh, and here is the same function with noise. We see the same thing, just more noisy as you would expect. Let's look at the standard confidence thing. This looks a lot different. So this does give us a different signal. Uh, you can see, as you want to be here at zero, this would be the 68%. And uh, initially, the random forest struggles a bit, but then it converges here. You see for 30 samples, it converges, and then it stays here. And this is simply because we calibrate the predictive uncertainty. So we, we, we divide by a factor so that this property is achieved. It basically just shows that this is working. Whereas the Gaussian process is quite on the, uh, I mean, 60% plus maybe 30, it's almost one. So almost all the samples are within. So his, the, these uh, intervals are too large, simply. I am not sure if this is a function of the Gaussian process or of the scikit-learn implementation I used here, but I'll find out. <laughs> okay, but just as an example that this gives you a quite different type of signal here. And since time is running out, I just want to show you one more thing. This is an insight we learned from, from this type of experiments. Again, the same Morse function. And here you have the random forest, and here the Gaussian process. Now let's look at this. The Gaussian process predictive variance only measures distance from training data. If you remember the initial decomposition, we had model uncertainties and estimation uncertainties. The, the predictive variance is just the estimation. Now, since this is a Gaussian process with a single Gaussian kernel, so a single length scale, and this function has different length scales, right? It's very flat here and changes rapidly here. So this length scale will always be a compromise here. And that, that you can see here. Here, for example, this opens way, this is a training data until here. This opens way too fast, and this opens way too slow. So it's a limitation of the model. OK, so far, so good. Let's look at the random forest. The random forest estimates that locally with jackknifing. It just looks at the neighboring points. And that is why we get a very sharp estimate here, very close, because the function doesn't change much. And uh, here, a much wider interval, uh, because the function does change a lot. So, but they're constant. Because we have constant leaves here, and, and all it can do is it can, it, can, uh, it can say, this is my uncertainty at this point, and it, and it propagates the uncertainty if we go further to the left, but it can't change it anymore. So what we see here are complementary failure modes for these two simple models. What the random forest doesn't have is distance from training data. The Gaussian process has that, but it just has no local estimate of the rate of change of the modeled function. Uh, so it lacks that. So these, basically, these two are complementary. They, all, uh, they measure, both measure another aspect of the predictive uncertainty. Uh, well, and that is something that you learn when you look at this, um, uh, uh, when you try to, to evaluate your, your predictive uncertainties. OK, uh, let me skip the rest. Um, yeah, you can look at the um, distributions and ask yourself how Gaussian they really are. Uh, but let's not get into that. So that's the summary. Um, I was talking about predictive uncertainty estimates. Uh, what are sources of uncertainty uh, in a prediction? And uh, we looked at some metrics to evaluate those. And the part that I haven't shown you, I just want to mention it, is uh, you, he uh, you heard the talk of Christopher Sutton just before mine. And there's other work that we have done that goes into the same direction, basically asked the question, <laughs> If, if error is uh, like local in input space in the sense that in some region it might be higher than in others, can we use this fact somehow? And we can, uh, well, maybe, maybe super briefly. Um, if, you, if you do active learning and search for new promising candidates, here you see a function, here you see two acquisition functions that use uncertainty in different ways. This one has a much lower overall error on the whole data set than this one, but this one finds the more interesting candidates. And that is because the error is different in, you can focus, as the observation, the key idea here is, if this is your input space and your interest, as, no, sorry, this is your property space, you have two properties here that you want to optimize, go to the lower left corner. If you focus here on the Pareto shell region, that is better for, for finding the next improved candidates than if you minimize the overall quality of the model here. Very straightforward, very simple, but makes a difference. All right, but that was just the five second <laughs> uh, quick. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. So I would like to thank the people that uh, contributed to the works that I showed and uh, all of you for, for uh, being here. Thank you.